Well, I'm here with one of the all-time legends of Lions rugby, hero from the 1997 winning side that went to South Africa and scorer of one of the all-time greatest tries, John Bentley. Bentos, how are you, mate? Andy, all good to see you. Lovely to be speaking to a Kiwi. Yeah, you too. You, too. you actually, you've been... I, mean, I know everyone knows you went on that tour. You also, you went to New Zealand in 2005 as well, didn't you? 2005 and 17 as a supporter, though. So. Yeah. Whilst it's brutal playing rugby in South Africa, I can assure you, drinking 24-7 for three weeks in New Zealand was pretty tough as well. <laughs> we're going to talk about rugby, uh, and we're going to get a first-hand account from John on what went on during the 97 tour. But if you want to read an incredible book about the tour, go and check out This Is Your Everest, The Lions, The Springboks, and The Epic Tour of 1997, written by Tom English and Peter Burns. It's available on polarispublishing.com forward slash book forward slash this hyphen is hyphen your hyphen Everest and is honestly one of the best rugby books you'll ever read so go and check it out for all the behind scenes stories from what was an epic tour but when you talk about how you, you bond with the squad and how you have to come together as a team how do you how do you do that what's the quickest way to I mean people people say you you know just get on the bears is that what you did no, 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 no. But be- be- beer, beer had its part to play on our trip. Um, it wasn't integral to the success, but it was integral for us to perhaps drop our guard and, and get to know each other a little bit. There were a number of things that actually we did, um, which is all down to the, I mean, I mean, the key ingredient initially was ninety seven was a was a watershed year in the sense that it was the first year that the coaches picked the players. So the coaches, Frank Cotton, the manager, Ian McGeekin and Jim Telfer, took 35 players away to South Africa that they picked, they wanted. So prior to that, in 93, a committee, nine people, 10 people picked who they felt would go to um, New Zealand. You know, we'll have a Scotsman, an Englishman, an Irishman, well, and split it accordingly. And ultimately, it was an ill-fated trip, was 93. But 97 was a group of players that the coaches picked. And they did a number of things, actually. I mean, it didn't come to fruition in that first week, but there were 18 Englishmen and 17 from the other three. And the captain always has his own room. And actually, we, was, it was decided that you would share a room with somebody different from a different country on each occasion, a different place. Because that's actually when you get to know a player, mm. when you room with him. It's like getting married. That's when you really get to know a girl, when you live with her and you've got to follow her into the bathroom the following morning. That's when you really get to know who she is. <laughs> and um, they also asked us or invited us to do our code of conduct. So they they knew what they wanted in terms of how we should behave and how we should adhere to certain challenges like alcohol, for instance, and the manner in which we train and, and, and our selection. And, and, and we actually decided what we wanted. And we had a team building week where, like I said, we only trained twice and we keep the living daylights out of each other. But during that week, we, we set some standards. And probably the biggest the biggest session that we had during the week was the code of conduct that we, we, we adopted, that we actually devised. And we, we agreed that we would all adhere to for the course of the eight, nine, ten month, ten weeks of the tour. And actually, as a result, you'll tend to find in management, and yourself, that if, if, if somebody tells you to do something and such a group, some rules and some laws, we tend to want to push those boundaries a little bit, don't we? Mm. And actually, we were invited to devise what we felt was appropriate. And as a result, would you believe, we placed it. So we managed that. And the management didn't need to get involved with that. We did that internally. The disharmony, um, is that, was that... When you actually talk about it, um, was it just people not talking to each other? Is that is that all there was, or would the people actually really not like the English? I don't think. It's, yeah, I, I think it generally is towards the English. I think yeah. it generally is. I mean, there were only four four Irish boys, and the Irish are great. There were only four of them. They're great. Everybody in the world loves the Irish. Yeah, and there were four great boys, four great lads: uh, Jerry Davison, Paul Wallace, Woody, and Eric Miller. Um, then you've got a mix of the, the Scots who were led by Doddy, Doddy Weir, who's phenomenal, beautiful person. Uh, but the Scots can be, you know, have you watched Braveheart? Oh, yeah. Watched, yeah, yeah. Well, you get why the Scots don't like the English, surely. You must it, get It that. explains it, yeah. It Absolutely. And then you get the Welsh, who the Welsh like to whine and moan, 
But but do you know what? And there's a big, strong group of Welsh as well. A lot of rugby league boys amongst them. Um, four of them, actually. Um, but good lads, all good lads. And we just recognised that we just needed to try and become that team mm. and just put the differences to one side. And everybody bought into it. Everybody did. And it's one of, I'll give you the greatest example. On a morning when you went down for breakfast and you turned around with the tray with a the cornflakes on and the, the orange juice. You didn't look around to see where anybody was sat. You just went and sat down. And it was an opportunity to get to know people that you wouldn't otherwise get the chance to do so. I was, was such a happy tour. Such a happy tour. Was there much drinking? Any any stories that you could yep. you could share f- with me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. From there? Yeah, we, it, it played a valuable part, actually. Eh? You know, drinking was not taboo with us, but but we did in our meeting say that, do you know what? If you want to drink, go for a drink. Have one. Because you tell somebody, some, somebody that they can't do something, they'll do it. Mm. They'll find a way to do it. And actually, he said, yeah, go for a drink. But just recognise that there is somebody in the hotel upon return or, you know, wherever you are, that, that somebody's preparing for the biggest game of their life in 24, 48 hours. Yeah. So generally... The boys who played on a Wednesday went out for a drink. The boys preparing to play on a Saturday didn't. But the boys who went out on a Saturday, well, well, actually, we all went out for a drink on a Saturday. And, and do you know, there's real, just one, 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 one sad, sad aspect about the drinking. Only on two occasions, only two, did we all go for a drink together. And there were two marvellous occasions. The first was on the Friday night before we flew out. And actually... Fran just said, we're going to the pub. We're going for a drink. And we all went. And all, there were a number of locals there. And it just we all got to know each other. And we spent a bit of time with each other. And, and then we flew out. Do you know when the second occasion was? The day after the third test. Oh, really? So it was near yeah. the, end of the, the end of the tour? Yeah. the day, ah. Because if you think about it, we were always preparing for the, a, a massive game. You know, there was no midweek game between the second and third test. Traditionally, there hasn't been previously for a number of years. But the day after, I think there were a couple of the boys were getting married upon their return, so we had a bit of a stagger. And all the press were there, which was great. And, there was, you know, they weren't working. They'd, they'd had a great experience. Jim Telfer's speech is now one of the most famous speeches in rugby. What was he like during the tour? And, and, and what about the other coaches? What about Geach? They were very different. Um, I mean, you know about the, the video that was brought out initially? It was a video, because how long ago it was. It was a video called Limo the Lions. VCR. Yeah, yeah, that's it, mate. Not Betamax, not that old. <laughs> <laughs> um, they were very different, very different. Geach was very calm um, and spoke extremely, with extreme emotion. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go to, I'll come to Geach in a second, but... But I always remember sort of Kingston Park when we initially got selected in an initial 62 um, in the January of 97 to travel down to, to Birmingham. And Doddy Weir said, you won't want to get picked for the Lions. You won't want to get picked. And the other four of us were bats. Tim Simpson, Tony Underwood, Alan Tay, myself. Well, you're not want to be. It's a Dim Telfer, a monster, just beast everybody. And actually on occasions I watched, I watched the game at the training session after we'd Beaten Western Province, but we got annihilated in the scrum. We got beat in the scrum. And it was all about achieving parity within the scrum, about matching them. Because that is their strength. The game is based around their scrum. And he absolutely gave them the most brutal training session ever. And we stood. We played a bit of touch and pass and whatever. We were doing a little bit of this. We were combing our air and whatever. Well, Guska was combing his air and whatever. And uh, looked across and uh, saw the falls. I got it from that moment. Why? But... But he had to knock the edges off the, the players because they were all they'd all got opinions about how they do this and how they do that. And Jim had to he had to be alpha male. Um, he hadn't he hadn't coached for four years, you know. But but he sorted them out. But you know, away from the field, he was a lovely man, quiet man, loved his family, um, not as theatrical as Geach with his speeches, but very black and white. And he laid the law down. You talk about the Everest speech that he, he got the players and we wouldn't have seen that speech except for it being on the video afterwards. Right. 
And actually, the big key message there was that you're going to do, you've been second best. You've been second best on occasions. And it was their opportunity to front up the forwards. And God, boy, did they front up. And what about Gage? Gage, on the other hand, was very, I love Gage. I loved him. Gage, I have had lots and lots of rugby coaches, and I haven't had many good man managers. I've had two that stand out. One was a guy called Malcolm Rayleigh, who was a rugby league man, and the other one was Gage. Gage, Gage empowered players, not by shouting and carrying on alarming, but by an arm round and told them, told them to go out and play and make sure you leave nothing in the locker. Don't ever come in the chair rooms afterwards and have to look in the mirror and think, if only. Mm. He also, I always remember the, the probably the other powerful speech. You talk about the Everest speech, which was before the first test um, against, or it could have been the second, I think it was the first test against the Springboks. But on the 28th of June, the, the, the speech that Geach delivered <clears throat> prior to um, us taking the field, 1 0 up in the three match test series, he didn't speak much about the rugby actually, but he did speak about the challenge. And he'd obviously been there in 74 with the Lions in 74. And he knew what was awaiting us out on that field. We didn't really know, really. But he spoke about things that were important, about life and about family and about the people who were giving you the opportunity to be, to be where you was that very special day. Then he also spoke very powerfully about the people that we were sat alongside um, in the room. <clears throat> and there'd be moments on the field um, that you'd be stood alongside one of them and, You'd look at them and you wouldn't be able to say anything. You'd be just exhausted. But it'd be just a look that would say that you were special. And he said that it may be 10, 15, 20, 30 years' time before you bumped into each other in a street and you wouldn't need to say anything. It'd just be a look. And that's so evident on so many cases. It's 24 years now on. And every time I bumped into one of those players, it's been so special because it takes us back to that very special day. Not just the day. The day was the 28th of June when we won the second test. We won the series. But 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 to the tour. You know, and I always... It was a happy tour was ours. Yeah, it's got to be result-led, Andy. Mm. Yeah, every tour is ultimately judged on the results. And you look at all the happy tours, they're generally quite successful on the field. But it's not always just about that. It's about creating that opportunity. And actually, I think creating that, that atmosphere off the field enables the stuff on the field to happen. The ones that have been challenging off the field haven't been successful on it. Do, do you know one of the biggest, biggest things, and it sounds great to have your own room on a rugby tour, but I tell you, touring can be a really lonely place. Mm. Not everybody's having a good day. And I always remember the day when Doddy got injured, when he got his leg snapped in half, and I went, <clears throat> I went to his room to pick, pick the camera up, which I'd acquired at the beginning of the tour, and um, we'd do a bit of fly on the wall stuff. And, um, but I went back to my room and laid all the pictures of the kids out, and, whatever, and I wanted to go home. I wanted to go home that day because um, it was sad. It was really wrong what had happened. What was uh, Martin Johnson like to play under? John, I was amazing. A surprise, do, do you know, he wasn't captain of England. He was, mm. I, I don't even know. If, he was probably captain of Leicester at the time. But what they wanted in a captain, they wanted somebody whom they felt was assured of test selection. They also wanted a big man to stand in front of Teichman. Teichman was a springbok captain. A springbok captain. They wanted somebody who would say, do you know what? We're, we're bringing a bit to the table here. I think the the best way to... John was quite shy, quite quiet. He's quite young and didn't say too much, actually. was quite shy, seriously. But he was surrounded by people who said a lot, a hell of a lot. But the one thing that John O did, he always had the final word and everybody always listened. And But there's different ways of leading, And There are people who go into the poetic verses of this, that and the other prayer. There are some people who just go out and do it, and he did it. And I, years later, I always remember years later, I was doing a jigsaw in the room. It's quite late at night. My boy had come in from training, and he put Sky Sports on. They were running back-to-back -back games of the three Lions tests, and I never sat and watched all three. I, I never watched them. I didn't watch the first one because I didn't play in it. 
Um, <laughs> I didn't really watch the third one because um, we lost it. And then the second one, I missed a tackle on Gilbert, so I didn't really bother about watching that. <laughs> I knew what the outcome was. But <laughs> my, my boy put it on, and I like I liked to watch when the ball moves away from the rock. I like to watch what's happening on the deck at the rock. And there was always Martin Johnson with his two foot soldiers, Jeremy Davison and Paul Wallace fighting before South Africa's on the floor. They just went for a fight in South Africa and ended up winning it. You know, that was... But he's... He's hard, he's, isn't he? Hard man. Hard man. Yeah. Great man. Great man. What do you remember of the opposition? Because I remember, it was it Cobus Visa and Oz Durant? Like two big names, two yep. very famous South African names. They were pretty vocal um, about them winning pretty much saying it was a formality did you guys take that on board did you know about it did it did it wind you guys up did you use it as a almost like a team speech to take any notice of it whatsoever we were just there to do a job and our job was to get better and better and better as the tour progressed and actually meet fire with fire we knew we couldn't match them in the scrum really if we just achieved a little bit of parity and i've used that word once earlier but you know, if we were, if we felt we were going to South Africa for a 15-man fist fight, bare knuckle fist fight, on it, we were going to lose that. So we played a style of rugby that we'd never played in the Northern Hemisphere prior to that, and that was Ian McGeekin's vision. And he ultimately picked players that he felt could slot into that game rhythm. And it was basically three, four, five men behind the ball carrier at all time and shift it, move it away from their strength. And, you know, I think they'll always rule. They, they went into the the second test without a recognised goal kicker. Neil Jenkins was phenomenal. He kicked everything. Mm. You know, that was a test we didn't really deserve to be in hand. We were second best on that day. They scored three tries. Um, but, you know, your man, Neil Jenkins, just kept us in that game. And up until the last three minutes, when I always remember the ball getting thrown from Matt Dawson to Jeremy Guscott with three minutes remaining. And he's got it in his hands and he dropped a go- drop goal. It went over, he gave us three points. And then three minutes, the final whistle went. And we won the game. 18-15, and I remember stood there, and it was the most frustrating moment of my life. I didn't know where I wanted to be. There were all the players on the field, there were lads in the stand, there was my family back home, and then I just remember stopping and thinking, oh, God, no, no. Why did it have to be Gus Scott? Of all the people, why Gus Scott? <laughs> Are you mates with Gus Scott? I love him. Yeah. I didn't think I would be. We'd never met before '97. You'll have to ask him this. I love him to bits. <laughs> I, um, I'd formed an opinion of him prior to 97, before meeting him. And I'd formed an opinion which wasn't very positive, but I didn't know him to his defence. But I, I thought he was quite soft. He appeared to me to be soft. Because that was sent around. He, you remember Bath played against Wigan in 1995 at Rugby League at Main Road, Manchester, and then Rugby Union at Twickenham. Bath I, Rugby League. I do, I do remember that. It was on, yeah, yeah, it was right. on TV in New Zealand. So, so Guska didn't play. And I thought, why wouldn't you play in that? They got a bit of money for that. Um, I also thought he was a little bit aloof, a little bit arrogant, which is not a problem. And I, I remember asking Tony, I said, well, what about, and I'd asked him about John and about Delalio. I asked, what about Gus Scott? And he said to me, he said, well, Bentos, if he respects you, you'll get on very well. And I never said anything. I just said to, and Tony said to me, he said, he will respect you. I said, you know what, Tony, you know me. You know me now. If he doesn't, I'll know. And in training, I'll pick him as a partner and I'll throw my wrist straight over the top of the shield, straight round the bridge of his nose. Smack him. And anyway, like, we, I, I, we got into the room when we were all meeting and they were all coming in, we were all being introduced. It was great. It was great. It was like, tools down, you know, let's get to know each other. And this was early doors. This was the start of a, of a journey. And I saw Gus Scott, and I was sat in the corner of me, and I saw Gus Scott walked in. Wow, what a presence. Mm. <laughs> Laughing and joking and shaking people's hands. And, and we got brought together, and he went, to be introduced, he went, ah, Bentos, and laughed. Oh, God. And I, I went top of my hand, and he said, I've heard a lot about you. Looking forward to spending some time with you. And I thought, wow, great. And I loved him to bits. We're still pals now. I, we do rip each other, but that's a sign of a friendship, Andy. Do you not agree? Yeah, I do. I do. He climbs, climbs into me a bit. He yeah. climbs into me by saying, mm, 
you wanted to put me on Robin Ireland with Nelson Mandela, you know, you know, get, get me out of the way and what have you. But but I, I get him, I get him, and I, we have we have a close friendship actually. We don't, and actually, do you know, do you know Andy as well as blokes? We don't live in each other's pockets, do we? We 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 shared an eight week period together, which, like Geach said, in thirty years time. It'll be very special, but but I bumped into Geach on uh, sorry Jerry on a number of occasions, and we hit it off. We 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 came back friends. What were the celebrations like after you won the series? It was it was a crazy night. We had, we had a crazy night. We were in Durban. Um, we all we all went out. We all went out. There were a number of British fans there. Um, we got disjointed a little bit. We got split up a little bit actually as a group. But we ended up in a bar called TJ's, um, where we all had a great, which went on to the early hours. Mm. You know, went to, because it was, it, was, it, was quite, it was quite funny, really, because we'd achieved what we set out to achieve um, in the second test. And I, I mean, just jumping forward, we then went to, a, to a, a camp in Johannesburg prior to the third test, which I swear is like Colditz. They either thought we were going to be 2 0 down and we, we were out of the series and we were fighting against the whitewash, or um, it was one apiece and we had to keep our heads on and there was nobody going to be around. We all wanted to be in Sun City for the week <laughs> to celebrate, you know, but yeah, it was quite a hard final week that. And, and do you know what? We, we set our stall up to, to try and whitewash them. But they picked Janny De Beer, the, the goal kicker, and mm. and it was a good game of rugby. Actually, it was the third test, but we ended up falling short. But but whilst the disappointment of losing that game, we, it was the acknowledgement that we'd we'd won the series. Actually, so what what were your um, favourite moments? You know, either on the pitch or 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 off the pitch on the tour. I don't know, it's difficult, really. I, I just felt really privileged to be part of it all, Andy. Throughout, mm. just I never lost sight of that how fortunate I was to be part of a, a team that was getting better and better by the game and that had so much belief in each other. Do you, do you know one of the, probably the biggest thing to say about it all was, I didn't, I didn't realise how big it was going to be until years later. I, I never, I, I never realised, I was, I was a, I was a professional rugby player who was playing rugby for a living, dare you say. Um, and actually, it was whether I was playing rugby league or rugby union. Obviously, this was on a different stage, a much higher stage with the stakes a lot higher. I probably didn't realise the implications of what we achieved until 12 years later. Really? You know? Yeah, and I think in 2001 and then 2005, in 2005, at the end of that tour, they were talking about, is there a place for the Lions anymore? Oh, Can no, the Lions no. survive in the current era, the professional era? Is, is there a place? It's been disastrous. Everything went wrong. Yet, 2009, it was back on track. Gates was back in charge um, in South Africa. And in 2009, whilst it was a brutal series, Everybody was looking forward to 2013 and then, of course, 2017. And now it's become so big. And it's it's probably... I probably get famous once every four years and really famous once every 12 years. <laughs> you know, when it comes back to South Africa. You know what my wife actually says to me? What's that? For sake, I don't get this. You, 24 years ago, went on one tour... You scored one try and you've got one speech. Fucking get over yourself. <laughs> it's fair. It's probably fair. But you're walking around the house and saying the speech every week, though. We yeah, get yeah. it every twelve years, four to twelve years. I've, yeah. I've been during the lockdown. I've been practicing on people in the park at the front of the house. Everybody's avoiding <laughs> me now. With your lion, with your lion shirt on. You know, so, do you know something, Andy? I, I went. There weren't many people knew who I was when I went away in 1997 in May of 1997, but all of a sudden when I came back, I, I probably, people knew who I was in the rugby union world and dare I say I became famous and I don't mean that in a, in a, in a weird way or a, a rude way, but I was just a rugby player. And do you know what, if I'm honest, Andy, I, I probably lost sight of what I was for a short space of time when I came back. You know, I was suddenly, suddenly 
<clears throat> going to London and signing book deals and doing this and doing that. And I was the only rugby player mm. that, that played rugby. I was never the best. Did you find it hard coming back and, and it being, well, not, I mean, you must have been enjoying yourself. I found it hard to settle down when I got yeah. back. The feet, you know, it, it was hard. It was hard, yeah. What, what advice would you give to the players heading over there now or that, are, that are in South Africa? The current Lions. Yeah. Well, Paramount to success is good. It's going to be different. It's surely going to be so different. But it looks good, some of the stuff I've seen, but it's about becoming a team. It's not initially about the results. Yeah, of course, it's result-led, and they've got off to a great start. If you count the game at Murrayfield, they've won that. They won the game on Saturday quite convincing. Um, but it's about staying focused and, and, and becoming that team. And, of course, the biggest challenge about any Lions tour, it's going to come a lot quicker this time. It's the week when the first test gets announced, when the first test side is announced. And we look back to 97, and we recognise that was going to be a big challenge. That's when... You could go off tour if you were potentially going to go off tour as a result of the disappointment about not being picked. And we actually decided that the onus should be on the player who wasn't picked to go and congratulate the player who was picked. We personally chose for that to happen. We also chose that we wanted to be informed with a letter under the door on the morning the team would be announced. That way you could deal with your disappointment or your ecstasy. But that's when generally they've recognised from previous tours that the dynamics of the, the trip can change. Yeah, a bit. And it's going to be tough as well in South Africa because they're in a bubble, aren't they? You know, and it's it's really, really important that they get on well because imagine being in a bubble with people you don't particularly like. Mm. So by the looks of things, they're working really hard at that and they recognise that. And Gats gets it. Gats is a Kiwi, but he gets the Lions. You know, Gates has always said that about him. His first tour was 2009. Um, he's done all three um, with a great record. He was assistant in 2009. Uh, 2013, they won. Um, only the fifth of, 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 you know, five victories in 132 years of touring, which is remarkable. Um, and then 2017, with quite a bizarre result at the end. It's not talking about that. I stadium and thought, uh, what do we do next? What happens next? Mm. And that's the it drew, they drew the drew of the series, which is fair enough. It was quite a dramatic finish, but so he gets what the Lions is all about. Um, he's done South Africa, but it'll be different. It, it'll be weird, and it looked weird without the supporters there, because it, I mean, Andy, the supporters have become a massive part of the Lions. Yeah, they are. Season. They are a big part of the tour. Oh, ma- well, in, in, that's that's happened since '97. So in '97, there weren't that many there because. 97 South Africa probably wasn't as safe as it is now. Um, also, we weren't given a chance. Why would you want to go and watch a side that's going to get flogged? Uh, but as a result of the win, 2001, you know, people took the opportunity, I'm sure, to go to, and 2005 to go to New Zealand, Australia, that you otherwise wouldn't choose to go. It's a long way. Mm. It's a hell of a long way to go. Tell I mean, me about it. 48 hours to get, 42 hours to get back from New Zealand. It's crazy. Unbelievable. Can you move a bit closer? <laughs> Fish New Zealand up here a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Th- well, thank you. Thank you very much for coming on the show. I really enjoyed the, really enjoyed the chat. Right, great, great yarn. Yeah, good. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've, I've been very honest. No, you have. You have. And if you want to find out more about the tour, check out This Is Your Everest, The Lions, The Springboks, and The Epic Tour of 1997. You won't regret it. And the link is in the description. Or you can find it on the Polaris Publishing website or search for it in Google.